Hello, and welcome to Covert Castaway. I'm Holly. Je suis Stéphane. Join us as we share what we learn and how we're making the transition to live aboard cruising. We've had some great questions from some of our listeners, which we wanted to talk about today. Um, asking for more detail on the nitty gritty living that we do on the boat um, and some basic, oh wow, there's a fly on my nose. Mm. <laughs> some more detail on logistics and, and living stuff. So I thought we could address some of those topics today. But before we do, as I swat at this fly, you want to talk a little bit about where we are and uh, paint a picture for our listeners where we're at? So we're on the Aegean Sea, uh, on Naxos more specifically. Um, we are basically for four or five days. We will have been here uh, to protect ourselves from, from the Meltemi. Um, so the winds uh, forecast is like 20 and gust 35. Um, so we wanted to find something um, uh, something uh, protected, which we did. Uh, now we're kind of in a cool place. I mean, uh, it's kind of a little bit of an amphitheater. <laughs> yeah, it does feel like an amphitheater a little bit. Yeah. And then there's a beach on the side, but we're not by the beach. And, but we see swimmers that are more adventurous that come. People can probably hear the fly. It's like buzzing around. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That comes behind the boat. Yeah. And uh, so it's been very, very uh, mellow. Very few boats have come here. If any boats, it's been, uh, well, no boats have stayed for the night. Yeah. And the only Which boats- is like partially cool and partially scary like what do they know that we don't know like, where is everybody else yeah. <laughs> in in mid-august in in greece yeah yeah something uh and just to explain so that so in this area they have different names for all the different winds and the meltemi is the one that comes from the north and blows pretty hard swirly unpredictable gusts that can are known to blow sailboats over and break mass um, so potentially, you, that's what they say. And big waves, yeah, and big, big waves. waves and sea state, yeah. right? So during this time, sometimes you can be hunkered down for weeks. Sometimes it's just a few days. For us, it's been like a handful of days. We've had to kind of watch out for it, and it's our first one, so we're being a little cautious. Yeah, we're observing, kind of learning. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, then we'll keep on moving, and yeah. then we'll have a feel a little bit more about. Uh, what the forecast when the forecast is x you know what we see because right. we can see past our anchorage uh definitely like white caps and the gust and, right and um so. so we're happy we're here and it's a really cool spot there's some cool rock formations and because there's a beach we have people kind of snorkeling behind our boat quite yeah. a bit every day water is cool. clear yeah jumping. sand bottom yeah sandy bottom it's it's been really awesome we're just sort of like observing the boat and, and um, the stern ties and everything yeah. like that. So so a little bit of setup for what we're going to cover today. Um, we, as we mentioned in a previous episode, where we go is sort of guided by the weather. So that's very different than like if you charter a boat for a week and you're like, okay, I'm going here. I want to see these five things. And you, you know, come hell or high water, you kind of do that. Um, what we try to do, and it's just our own personal preference, is we tend to get somewhere, enjoy it, not have a lot of expectations, and then wake up the next day and say, okay, what do we want to do next? We look at the weather, we determine kind of pros and cons, where to go from here and and whatnot. So f like, for instance, with Naxos, um, we were on... Uh, Milos, we loved it, and, and then we kind of moved to the island just above it, and then we said, oh, okay, where are we going next? It's it's Eos or it's Naxos, and we picked Naxos because the Meltemi was coming, and we thought chances were higher we could find a protected spot. We did then overnight in Paros. Per Paros, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so that's a little bit of the setup. So in terms of figuring out, you know, where we want to go, we always have these trade-off conversations. Um, and they go something like this, like, oh, well, I really wanted to see maybe this island or this thing or, 
you know, people talk about going here or going there. Yeah, but the wind isn't really going to do that. So, you know, do we want to risk it and not finding a, a good spot where we're protected? Or do we want to, you know, try to see something else? So, you know, depending on the direction of the wind. So we have to have these discussions. And sometimes they happen every day because the wind changes every day. And um, so, you know, those are... We spend quite a lot of time right now kind of doing that because I think we're trying to really assess the trade-offs in, in some of these weather situations or wind situations as it works. The weather's been great other than the wind. Yeah, I mean, the wind has been, it's pretty much steady from the north here. Mm -hmm. We got one time uh, back in Mills where we had westerlies, <clears throat> but the rest is pretty much northerlies, northeast, northwest. Um, so it's more about, in this case, how much wind. Mm -hmm. And uh, so is there melting in the forecast or not? Mm -hmm. If you don't, then you have a little bit more options. But then you need to also look at the days beyond. And that's going to say, okay, <laughs> to dictate a little bit like, okay, we'll go there, but then we'll probably need to move somewhere. And, and then, yeah, we go back and forth and with multiple plans yeah. And eventually we settle on one. <laughs> yeah, we always seem to kind of get to the same place. You know, but the conversation today was, okay, after this part of the Meltemi goes through, there's a couple days that are, you know, calm where we could go somewhere. And then after that, you know, it kind of starts to become unpredictable again so far. So, you know, I had my heart set on Santorini. That's kind of what you think about when you go to the Cyclades. And, um, you know, it was definitely something that I had set an expectation around. Now, I also know that it's the height of the tourist season. The place is packed. Um, you know, there's no really easy, good places to anchor there. So it's mooring balls. We called the guy about the mooring balls. They can only give us one night. And we're like, wow, if we sail all the way down there and can only stay one night, is it worth it? Especially given, you know, tourist season, da, da, da. So, um, you know, given that little window we had and some other uh, constraints, you know, we made the decision this season not to do that, which is probably a better decision. Um, the other option, too, was to leave the boat here, which made me nervous, mm. um, and then go in and take a ferry to Santorini, stay a couple nights and, and ferry back. But that would mean the boat is basically stern tied to a cliff. Um, with, an, with the anchor down and everything, so it's got three points of contact to the ground. Um, but it would be basically unattended for three days, and I just don't think that's a... For, for me, I, I don't know, I'm too, I'm too nervous and don't think that's the right decision for us. I think I would not leave the boat here unattended during the Mel Temi, even if yeah. we have been here for a few days and the boat is behaving well and there is no reason why you would not do the same thing yeah um but in this case the wind will be lighter than what we've been experiencing the last four or five days so from my point of view that will be okay uh, i think what freaked you out a little bit is what happened yesterday yeah so a yacht came in yesterday and they were professional crew it looked like he had three professional crew on mm -hmm. board and it was a family and so that's fine. They know what they're doing. So they came in. They stern tied to. They were going to be here the afternoon. And no big deal until they went to leave. And suddenly they're, what, within a meter of our bow? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> usually if somebody comes in or leaves, we monitor them to see what they're doing. Right. In this case, we looked at them monitor them as they came in and like you said they know what they're doing right so as they're leaving we were sitting in the cockpit and we didn't even pay attention because we thought you know and now the boat they... started moving though our boat started moving well no, but first it's like what well, they they released the, the the lines to shore and and then it was like basically go forward and pick up your anchor even though the wind blows a little bit sideways yeah but i i really didn't think like they will do anything, anything crazy. And then suddenly we feel the bow like kind of like swerve. Yeah. And we're like, what, what the heck is, is that? On? Like, is that a wave that, you know, and some strong gust? And then, uh, then we'll go forward and we're like, wow, this boat is just like the stern. Really just close passed. to our yeah. bow. And, and they're like, don't worry, don't worry. We just hit the rope. You mean our, 
our anchor like that's what the bridal the bridal for our anchor you mean like yeah mm-hmm. so they were that close that and casual some part about of the it. boat of the yeah. model yacht it was like 21 meter boat yeah um some part of it so it could have been you know hit the bridal the, yeah the, the, the propeller or we didn't know like what hit it uh but it was yeah. that close because the bridal goes on an angle yeah to, in to the anchor chain so i mean luckily they 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 missed the boat and uh, and then you know i had to dive on it afterwards sure, to yeah. just make sure that the propeller didn't kind of cut the bridle but this, this or, is the kind of stuff that like made me completely rethink like you think okay well it's it's protected from the weather and it's gonna you know hold really well the place seems really safe and then something like that happens and you're like okay no way. Mm. We're leaving but the other the boat. day we left the boat for the day. Yeah, and... which we'll talk about next, yeah. actually, because um, I wanted to give people sort of a detailed mm. scenario of like what it's like to live on a boat and also try to sightsee and act like a tourist. Yeah, and and I think um, in this case, I guess there is a difference between leaving the boat for the day and and, and, yeah. and to make it worthwhile to go uh, to Santorini. Uh, by taking a ferry down there and staying, you know, on Santorini Island, uh, we were talking about doing three nights. Yeah, so that's that would a be big a few difference. more days. Yeah. yeah. So we get to Naxos, and um, by the way, like we were anchored around the corner, sort of in this flat bay, but it was a lot of wind, like directly on, and so mm-hmm. we took the dinghy over. And we assessed this spot, and we're like, "Oh, let's move. Okay, let's move." And it took us pretty much all day, like to get well, set between up. Between the time you move from Peros to Naxos, it's not super long; it's yeah. maybe fifteen nautical miles, but that's going to be like you know, uh, three hours quickly. And, yeah. And then we checked uh, along the coast a couple spots where we thought we could anchor. Then we settled on one. We anchored. We dive on the anchor. We feel how the boat behaves, and and then uh, thinking that there is more wind to come for more days we're like well it's okay spot but is there like a better spot and we were just going for a dinghy ride we were going to go check out this abandoned hotel which we we posted pictures for on our on our blog we have polar steps you can map everywhere we've been and it also posts pictures of where we've been so there's a bunch of pictures on of there on that but we were going to go to that and we ended up seeing the spot and we were like oh this is a better spot let's move so we came back to the boat, and then suddenly you raise anchor, you come here, and then, you know, we had time to check also uh, the bottom, the rocks, where to tie to. So we raise anchor, come here, touch the boat, and then you kind of want, you know, same time, every time you put an anchor down and just wait and see how the boat behaves. and Yeah. And so, yeah, pretty much all that is all day but it took some time because we you know the first thing you do when you do stern ties is you you drop your anchor you attach we like to attach the bridle so that was set up we were like okay we have a good handle on the direction of the wind so that was kind of working for a minute in our favor stefan jumps off the port quarter to go attach the line to a rock and he's swimming with the line, and I'm feeding out the line. Meanwhile, the boat is in reverse on the starboard engine to kind of keep it straight to where we want it to be pointed to. So I'm feeding out the rope, feeding out the rope, and um, a gust comes from the east, which is the not the direction in which we're thinking the boat. That's the direction I'm swimming. That's the direction you're swimming. <laughs> so, so the boat kind of starts well, floating in the things. other direction. There were two things, yeah, because we have a 100-meter line, and I bag it into two bags. And um, and and so I unbagged just one, basically 50 meters, thinking it would be good enough. Because it's always been enough. Yeah. yeah. And But as the boat moves, <laughs> <laughs> suddenly I'm swimming. I'm maybe like, you know, 5, 10 meters away from the rock. And it's like, ooh, I'm not moving forward. And I'm trying to... I'm trying to pay the line out, but then I ran out of line, which was in the other bag, tied together, which I couldn't get the tie yeah. off quickly enough. And the boat is meanwhile we have like swerving in the wrong direction, gust, and the boat is moving away from where yeah. I swim, and you cannot really put the port engine on oh, t- either. And to add to add the detail to it, there's a what hundred meter yacht behind us. Um, How big was it? Hundred meters? No. How big was it? How big was it? <laughs> no, uh, maybe a hundred feet. 
100 feet. Yeah, yeah. 100 feet behind us. And, um, you know, it was far enough away, but they were looking at us like, do they know what they're doing? Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I couldn't put the reverse on the port engine because the line was in the water as I was trying to pay it out. Mm-hmm. And the starboard engine wouldn't turn the boat um, on the anchor. So we had some challenges. Yeah. Um, you had to keep feeding me the line. Yeah. I had to attach it to so the we, rock. I so had we to finally swing back to the boat. Yeah, so he swims back to the boat. We finally get the boat to pivot after, you know, a long time trying to get that to happen. The guys from the boat next to us come over with the dinghy and they ask us if we need help. And we're like, please stop talking to us because we're trying to concentrate on what well, we're doing. But by that time, I'm back on the boat. Yeah. So we're playing with the engines to get moved the stern yeah. back in place. And, and the I'm wind's kind of swirling. Putting on the, uh, the line. And yeah. So we, we know we're going to get it back the way we want yeah. it. It's just going to take a bit of time. Yeah. So long story short, things just take time. Yeah. And so by the time we got the boat all set up and we were confident in what was going to happen, we were like, okay, let's go to Naxos. Um, for the day because... Well, we still went that evening well, to Well, we hotel. went to see the hotel, yeah. yeah. But the next day, we were going to go to Naxos and go sightseeing um, in town, and we wanted to kind of check out the island because we only had one day before then the Meltemi was supposed to come where we had to be on the boat. Mm-hmm. So we're in sort of this, like... I don't want to call it deserted because there is a beach and people show up at the beach every day, but it's sort of in the sticks. It's not close to you know, the downtown area. It's like dirt roads to yeah. come all the way here. And well, the end of it is dirt roads. Yeah. And um, you've probably heard in our podcast before, we try to avoid marinas and quays um, as much as possible. They're just chaotic. Um, we're not comfortable yet, I guess. In uh, that. It's not comfortable. It's more like we don't enjoy being around <laughs> other it's, boats it's, and it's, other people. It's just a lot. It's yeah. a lot, and you know, there's a lot could happen, and it's noisy and whatever. So, we choose to be at anchor. So this is, you know, of our doing. Um, so we're in this kind of place in the boonies, and so um, we've been having trouble with our stand-up paddleboard. It just won't keep air in itself. <laughs> it has one, two, three, four patches. <laughs> a bunch of patches. I think we're making progress, but uh, every other it's... day it seems Stefan's patching it up. Um, but anyway, and we didn't want to leave the dinghy because there's no real place to leave the dinghy. So here was the plan. So the plan was we were going to swim to shore. We were going to put our clothes in a dry bag. And then once we got to shore, we were going to change our clothes and we were going to walk over the hill to the beach, um, walk down the beach to the bus stop and see when the bus left or see if we could get a taxi into Naxos, go into Naxos, rent a scooter and and drive around the island like that was our plan so you want to describe what happens Uh, exactly that (laughs) (laughs) we we did all of that so so first except for our yeah so in the dry bag we put our clothes and our phones and And important paperwork like your driver's license and yeah because um i had my french driver's license my european passport to rent the moped it's easier so we get to shore, open the bag. So, so far, so good. We swam to the rocks. We're on the, on the rocks and open the bag and everything is wet in there. Well, not everything. Your shorts are dry. Half your shirt's dry. Well, my the underwear paperwork's was dry. Wet. Your underwear were wet. <laughs> and, and my clothes were soaked. Yeah, because they were at the bottom. Neither of our phones were wet. So that was good, uh, too. Mine got a little, a little wet. Bit. Yeah. So our, our dry bag was a wet bag. And basically. Mm. So anyway, we did the best we could. We walked over the hill um, and followed the goat poop around, mm-hmm. which is kind of how we found our way to the other side of the hill. We stashed our our wet dry bag with our other stuff in there and um, went over. And at the taverna, the was a bus stop and the bus didn't come till noon and it was 10 and we had wanted to kind of go early in. So the guy called us a cab. He said, don't worry, it'll show up in like 15, 20 minutes. It was an hour later, not complaining because the taxi did come, but mm-hmm. the lesson learned is Greek time is kind of like island time. It just happens when it happens. Oh, it's it's super busy right now. And it's right busy, now. yeah. Uh, and that's what the taxi was explaining. And, and having done the ride all the way to Naxos town, 
Uh, that's 45 minutes, just like... No. Yeah, it was 45 minutes yeah. to town. We thought it was going to be like 30 but, minutes. And but then, there was lots of traffic. Lots of traffic. And then you traffic. go through a small town that has basically space for one way. Yeah, I mean, there are there not... there is no traffic lights. Their so infrastructure like, isn't set up for this many cars, for yeah. sure. And he, it was sort of like... He was a tax private taxi, but then he stopped and picked up other people too. He's like, well, because they get they get other customers, mm-hmm. and when you come all the way to where we are, like you know, forty five minutes away from, yeah. from the the main town where the ferries leave and stuff, yeah, they're like, okay, you know, I'm not going back and coming yeah. down to pick up somebody. So he says, well, we're going to pick up. Somebody and it was else. cool. She was a Italian woman who was meeting her husband at the at the ferry or something, but. Yeah. And she I was stressed. Stre- because- I was stressed for her because she was on a timeline. We weren't on a timeline. Yeah. So anyway, he drops us off at the scooter rental place because we told him what we were trying to do. He's like, where do you want to go? We're like, I don't know, someplace we can rent a scooter. He's like, mm. I got a friend. Trust me. He's mm. going to give you such a deal. And so we get there and uh, yeah, they were really nice. We rented a scooter. We have... Um, done this a few times we like to rent the scooters you have a motorcycle license so it's, it, i think you know i feel safer but tip for people who want to travel at least what we've observed like in i mean we have bikes on board and i think it's very useful especially when you stay at one location like you you can use your bikes regularly uh, when we go to some islands i mean those are this like, is a big island this yeah. is a big island they are like hills yeah so you have to know when you can. There's use no the biking bikes. access. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So we like to do that. But if you can get your driver's license, motorcycle driver's license, then it opens the door uh, to rent uh, those little mopeds that are like it was a 300 cc's. And if you have just an American driver's license, make sure you get an international. Uh, permit which you can get online in like 15 minutes it's not it's not hard yeah, to for do 25 euros yeah, i think but it's not hard but to plan do. plan to get that because they well now i'm using my french driver's license which I, seems to be fine yeah. but we got you one anyway because yeah, yeah. yeah and um but in one place like i forgot i had brought my french driver's license so we had to do that and they would have not rented uh, right. well they could have rented us the moped but they say if you get stopped, yeah, yeah that would be a problem. And they're trying to be on the app. So end. anyway, get your drive motorcycles, driver's license if you're waiting for your boat or for your plan is like a couple of years from now. And when you're ready to leave, yeah. get your And different people feel, you know, different levels of safety on a, on a scooter or a moped. They're pretty prevalent around here. Um, we saw like a dad with his kid on the back and a mom with the kid on the back. So a family of four would go on the mopeds. The and cars, um, you know, in these little towns, there's like not a lot of places to park. Um, the qu- They have quads. They have quads. I mean, they're fun. Rent. Yeah. But uh, for parking, like for parking mopeds and to go through the small On high streets. season, parking's a problem. So the, yeah. the mopeds are kind of easier. Very flexible. Yeah. So we toured the town. Um, excuse me. We toured the island as much as we could. We went and saw some really cool places um, up in the mountains. Um, and, and the s- way we got this information, it was at the at the Yeah, we just say to the place. moped, hey, where should we visit? And they have like, a map and then yeah. they show us like, oh, you need to go there. It's like, okay, what's your like number one, two, three? Right. And then we just say, and okay, that's how we follow what the locals suggest. That's what we kind of say. And then um, we came back and we had, we walked around um, Naxos town, they call it the Chora, the downtown, and down by the port. And um, yeah, then we had dinner and then we went back and then, you know, got the cab ride back. And then in the dark, we, we marched over the hill and tried to find our bag in the dark. Well, we had, we had a flashlight and, um, and phones. And not a true flashlight. It was yeah, a, it's a charger <laughs> with yeah. a flashlight on it. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, and but, yeah, and then I don't know. I, I didn't really want to swim to the boat in the dark. I don't know. It was a thing. And so, Stefan, because you're my hero, you swam back to the boat. Save the day. Save the night. Save the day. <laughs> turned the blue lights on so we could see the boat. Got my air mattress, which was the best nine euros I've ever spent. Um, brought the air mattress back and we put all of our stuff that needed to stay dry not from the wet dry bag but really needed to stay dry on the mattress and then we both swam back i brought an ikea bag and a plastic trash bag another 
uh, dry yeah. bag that's smaller just for our phones. Yeah. And uh, and I brought a flashlight. And yeah. So. so that's a little bit of the nitty gritty how we kind of visit places. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. not for everybody. And, you know, I was telling Stefan, it, it's so funny because... You know, you go to these towns and and you see these couples walking around. They're all decked out. And, you know, these women have these beautiful Greek dresses on. Their hair is perfectly coiffed and their makeup. And they've got the sunglasses and the cute shoes and stuff. And here I am. I look like a hillbilly. Like, none of my clothes are are dry. You know, I'm, I like my hair is all wet. You know, I have no makeup on or anything. So We're nomads. It just depends on what kind of experience you want to have. Um you know, just yeah, yeah. thank you for loving me the way I am. Yeah, well, thank you for being flexible because, you know, yeah. you, you need two people to be really flexible to be able to do those type of things. Yeah. I mean, you could always go into the quay. You can have that experience. Yeah, there are other ways to do different. it. And there is a little bit of an adventure to the way we do it. Um, but we yeah. like it better that way. Yeah. Um, okay, so another question we got was just about food, you know, like, and um, the food experience. And a lot of you guys know that Stefan is is a good practicing vegan. I'm a, you know, cheating vegan. But we do try to live a healthy lifestyle as much as we can because we do live on a boat. You can't really eat at Tavernas every day. I mean, you can. And we, we ate a lot more at them um, Mm. when we were with our buddy boat uh, just because that's what we ended up doing but we prefer to have more of a balance Um, I think you know some of the food it's amazing but in some of these towns that can be touristy it's hard to have a consistently good dining experience that's Mm. my opinion I don't know what you think yeah no I agree and and the the menu we're just looking at a Subset. Yeah, I mean, we have we have we have constraints. So it's like we're not looking for like braised lamb and like the best wine in the world. Like it's more, you know, can we eat a healthy somewhat vegan? Yeah. yeah. So it can be repetitive fairly quickly. Uh so we like to kind of spread the days. Yeah. Uh well, when we go on, on land to visit, that's basically, I mean, we obviously do that. Uh and um yeah, and also I mean, we had we went to this um, small town that was recommended, and and then the, there was like a bunch of restaurants and lots of people, and and we stopped at one, and the menu looked great, and everything was pretty like even the French fries were like we're like we're not even we're, we're like full of oil still. Well, well and, fries are fried. I mean, you I know, know, but, but like, I think the point is there's there's a they cook with a lot of olive oil to begin with, and then they drizzle olive oil on Even everything. the lemon cake at the end, we were like, okay, let's finish with a lemon cake that we'll share. And even that was like... Yeah, but I don't want to like leave the impression that the food here is bad because oh, it's no, no, been... No. We've had great food. I was answering to, you know, yeah. it, can, it can vary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so and sometimes you're like, well, that was not that great. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. And um, But we don't do a lot of research either on great restaurants. We sort of wing it, you know. We're, we're, well, we were looking at, um, you know, TripAdvisor and vegetarian, vegan friendly and look at the menu. And um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of what we do. Yeah. So in terms of like feeding stuff on, um, you know, what, what <laughs> we me. tried to do at the beginning of the season is provision as much dry food on the boat as possible. So I have like tons of beans and Anything dried you can think of, um, muesli and oatmeal for days, nuts, seeds, weeks, months. You yeah. know, like yeah, weeks, months. Um, we even, uh, I think I mentioned in a previous podcast, like we bought out like all the soy milk. I think in Corfu, um, we just went from store to store and and took well, as much as we could. Before that, in, in yeah, even before that, in split, <laughs> in split. And um, so there's that. So it's really the fruits and vegetables that I, I focus on spending a lot of time provisioning for. And so everywhere around here, we've had markets with really good yeah. fresh fruits and vegetables. So that's been great. But yeah. they, they, are, they tend to be more organic. Um, so without a lot of the preservatives, they, they go bad more quickly than they normally would, I think, in the U.S. Mm. And so you have to you have to kind of do it more often, um, just in terms of what it costs. So to eat out for two, 
uh, for us. And we tend to order more, you know, multiple smaller mezze kind of plates and share stuff. Um, so no big main entrees. Um, and we don't drink, so um, you might have a smoothie or something, but we kind of just drink a lot of water. Mm. And, you know, typically our meal would be 30 euros, mm-hmm. I'd say max. Um, sometimes less, but pretty much that's kind of the average. Mm. And then if I provision fruits and vegetables with everything else on the boat that I have or in the freezer, so I, I like prepare food and I'll make double what I need for a meal or two, and then I'll freeze some in the freezer, um, you know, so I, I kind of have stuff kind of in, in backlog there. Um, but if I go grocery shopping and it lasts for maybe four or five days, it's about 50 euros um, is mm-hmm. what I spend. So that's kind of how we do that. It's pretty much everything we can carry. And the biggest rule of thumb is if we find something we like, we buy as much as we can wherever it is we're buying it. So, mm-hmm. for instance, a certain kind of cookie or a certain, you know, spice or, you know, some something quinoa quinoa yeah like if black you, beans black beans <laughs> yeah anywhere. you can't find them anywhere just buy as much as they have um because you'll use it and um you can't always find stuff so the next topic is what i'll just call utilities so water fuel trash and laundry so um water we make on the boat with our water maker we've never had any issues um yeah, we have a 12 volt, 105 liter per hour, and we have 700 liters, two tanks connected in yeah. as one. Yeah. So we can actually even, and I did it today actually, I, I um, busted out the pressure washer and I washed the boat with water we made in our water maker. If we're at a marina or something, you can do that from the marina water, but um, we're, we can do it on the boat as well. So that's water. Fuel. So how much diesel have we used so far this season? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, we left Montenegro with a full tank. Right. Which is 940 liters uh, total, two tanks. Um, we refilled, we topped off those tanks back in Split, Croatia. I don't remember how much we had. I think we had like 70 or 75% full. So it was yeah, just a quick probably top Probably because we only did, you know, right. Croatia. Um, but there was an opportunity to fill up and we didn't know like... You when know, we would, yeah. yeah. And since then, uh, so now we have roughly a little bit below 50% on both. And uh, we are like what 150 200 nautical miles before we get into turkey so we have plenty of fuel if we have to motor to get to turkey and and i haven't looked at um, the distance i mean there will be wind to sail down the south the the coast of turkey going south uh but if we have to motor i will probably be okay to finish the season with what we have yeah yeah, so to fill up the tanks um, with the, the per liter cost is about what one seventeen or one twenty or something like that. One euro oh, twenty we, per liter. Oh, we we refilled in uh, Preveza. So, yeah, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, we refilled in Preveza. I don't remember how many percent we had left. Yeah. So yeah, we did that too. So to completely fill up, it's it's like you know nine hundred a thousand euro to completely fill up tanks. But we haven't done that. We've been kind of topping off, hmm. um, and we do try to sail as much as possible. Uh, a whole another podcast is going to be about um, how to sail and and in the med and what we've experienced in terms of what you can and can't do. Um, so that's a different and one topic. Thing we've but we've done uh, more this season than the last season is to when the sea is flat or when the, we are following uh, seas, um, then it's pretty easy to motor on one engine. Mm-hmm. So we use both to maneuver, to raise the anchor, and then we'll switch uh, one off. Yeah. And then we'll go on cruising speed on one engine, and then we alternate. Right. To obviously, uh, because the fuel tanks don't communicate, so to yeah. roughly... Uh, and the goal is not to motor, but it, it just so happens around here, like where you're trying to go isn't always the, the direction that the wind is going, and there's either too mm. much wind or not enough wind. So, 
Anyway, mm. different topic for a different day. Um, trash. So trash is funny because we we maybe store a couple bags on the boat. Um, but if I go to the grocery store or the market, I'll take in the bag of trash with me um, stealthily in my Ikea bag. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you can find a dumpster just right exactly where you need it. And sometimes you have to just kind of be sly about it and put it in a trash can. Mm-hmm. Um, it you was, don't want your bags to be too big because sometimes yeah, it's just a public trash can. It's just a public can, little small. trash can, yeah. And Italy was, I think, more sensitive about it. Um, twice, like, I got a dirty look from someone trying to put it put it in a, in a public trash can once. And then another time we put it in a dumpster. And remember, we came back to our dinghy and they had put it back in our boat mm-hmm. in our dinghy, which is so bizarre. Um, but, I mean, they, they do have trash challenges, especially in Sicily. So, uh, yeah, understandable. I mean, but here in Greece, island, it seems to be... But those are islands, too. So, I yeah. don't know what they do with their trash. Yeah. But it's, in Greece, it seems to be... There it seems to be a lot more trash cans that are readily available. Mm-hmm. Uh, for tourists to use even so well no we've seen some um dump uh, little dump areas yeah, yeah so and it's pretty sad because it's not really well organized and that's where you have you know rats and yeah. they develop in small towns and can go come onto boats but that was a really tiny town like in some of these bigger places there's a lot of dumpsters around like yeah they, they, but they we don't it... know where they dump it like yeah. you know yeah so um, and then laundry. So I have a washer dryer on board. And in hindsight, I think I probably wouldn't have gotten one put on the boat because, um, one, it's so hot, we barely wear any clothes and they're easy to hand wash and put out. Um, but secondly, even for towels and sheets and stuff at any of these towns, they have little laundry mats and you just drop off your laundry and they do it for you and you pick it up, but sometimes they deliver it to you. So there's a lot of laundry services that are super easy. Yeah. I mean, to have a washer, I think can be convenient. Mm -hmm. Um, the dryer, because we're not full time, uh, we kind of like cruise, um, it was handy warm. when it was colder, like yeah. in Montenegro when we were at the marina. That was, but the laundry services were closed because of COVID. Yeah. Otherwise, you could just take it in. So. But otherwise, for the dryer, um, because we have the latest technology around us with wind and solar, um, you put the clothes outside and it's yeah. dry in no time versus you put them in the dryer and. Sh- yeah, again, in the winter or when it's raining. Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, and then the last topic is really around what I'll just call admin stuff, which is uh, we got questions about, like, how do you get your mail and file your taxes and, you know, take care of all that. Everything's online. So, um, actually, my mail gets forwarded to um, one of my family members who basically takes pictures of stuff and sends it to us over WhatsApp, and we respond if we need to. But mostly everything we do is is online. We have everything set up for online billings and payments and notifications and everything else so that's not really an issue obviously we pay our taxes um during tax season and um you know it's no no issue there yeah Yeah, because also we have access to the internet yeah Um, and that's another thing like wi-fi has been great yeah in greece and in croatia yeah and granted we have an antenna on top of the mast Mm mm-hmm um, so we probably have yeah. decent reception. Yeah, it's like we want to go live this life off the grid, but we really don't necessarily want to be off the grid either. So Yeah, there's, it's a catch-22. Yeah. Like at first when we, Croatia was, you pay, I forgot how much per week, you have unlimited data, so it was like super easy. In Montenegro, it's the same thing. It's for a month, it was 15 euros for like 500 gigabytes. So you you don't even think about it. It's just like being at home. And then when we entered Greece at first... It was before the season started. So you had to buy a number of gigabits or whatever and then top yourself off and do this all the, all the other stuff. But once it turned into tourist season, they just give unlimited... You get a SIM, it's like 13 euros, and it's unlimited data for a month. So So, it's not a big deal. So when we started, it was more like definitely turn off all the things we don't need. and You don't realize how much you use just by doing nothing. Yeah, Yeah. and and suddenly, uh, so it was good because then you spend less time 
you don't watch YouTube, <laughs> uh, although it's very useful to get access to some information, but uh, you're very limited or reduced bandwidth. But yeah. um, so, but the advantage is, well, you spend more time doing other things. Yeah. You know, otherwise, you fall back into the regular trap. And yeah, sometimes we do. We do the like endless news feed scrolling, you know, and we catch ourselves to try to not do that. But mm. um, yeah, so, but Wi-Fi has not been an issue at all. So those are some answers to some of the nitty gritty questions we've been getting. Um, Again, if you have other topics, uh, please go ahead and submit those to sailingowen at gmail.com. You can check out places we've been and see pictures of where we've been on a map that's on our homepage, on our blog, which is um, sailingowen.com. And um, if you have other topics you want us to cover, um, you know, again, send those in. But I think just to close in general, I think, you know, what we're finding out in this season is how we like to do this, right? And we're still kind of balancing what I'll call a living pace with a tourist pace because we only have so many days, you know, of a visa or whatever in certain places. So, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the visa is definitely, uh, you know, 90 days in Schengen. Um, So Croatia was outside Schengen. Uh, Once we entered Greece, then you mark that date in your calendar, and then you're kind of loosely at the beginning keeping track of those 90 days. But once you get towards the end and you start to like, okay, we need to get outside Schengen by this date. And then you have the Meltemi and like all these other things. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so that adds up to, um, you know, you don't worry about it until you have to Goes start thinking quickly. about it. Yeah. And, and that dictates a little bit also which way you're going to go, <laughs> yeah, where you want to right. exit Greece and enter Turkey. And uh, and again, knowing that the winds are going to be mostly mostly northerly, like once we enter Turkey, I mean, we we want to enter as north as possible on the eastern coast, on the western coast, sorry. And so then we can sail down where whenever mm-hmm. we want to go south, as yeah. opposed to motoring into the wind. Yeah. But, you know, again, it's just this constant balance of like, oh, we want to see all these things to yeah. with like we live this every day, though. So we don't want to necessarily, you know, get burnt out trying to like do everything and, you know, go everywhere either um, within the c- constraints and certain limitations we have. So yeah. and and to be fair, I mean, those places, it's Greece is huge. I mean, we're yeah. only talking about I mean. There are many groups of islands, and so we've done the Ionian Islands. Now we're the Aegean Sea, but there is North, Middle, and South. Yeah. Uh, you have other group of islands, um, and then you have inland. You know, so you can spend years. Yeah. yeah. So to be to be fair to the country, to the islands, I mean, you have to spend seasons, you know, multiple seasons, yeah. and. So then it's a choice, you know. Do you want to really want to spend five, six seasons in Greece? Taking um, your time, yeah. And taking your time or Greece and Turkey. Um, I don't know. For us, we're like, we want to taste. We already prioritize Greece and Turkey and a little bit of Croatia. Um, So we want to spend some time, but we also know there are beautiful places in the rest of the world. So we kind of also want to be moving. And again, taste a little bit of everything and then truly find out what you want to, yeah. what you enjoy. But also not drive ourselves crazy trying to see all the things that we're supposed no. to see. Like, I think that's the the thing is, is um, you know, doing the places you go justice, like really enjoying the places you are and not worrying about going to all the places you're supposed to be going because mm-hmm. you're never, then you're never really going to do that, you mm-hmm. know, so... I don't know. That's kind of what we're discovering about our style and and yeah. kind of what we're settling into. Um, and it's something that can be done. I mean, in the off season, if you're not cruising full time, and you put the boat on the hard or the marina during the winter, granted, it'll be a different experience. Colder, yeah. But there will be less tourists. But you could spend go back to those places where you know it might be a little bit more complicated to bring your boat and. And then focus on, on you know, yeah. the part of the countries that you want to focus on. So, yeah, yeah it's a balance. It's a balance, yeah. yeah. It's uh, many choices. Mm-hmm. 
Cool. So that's all we have for today. Uh, thank you again for listening and fair winds for now. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please subscribe, like, or share with another covert castaway. Fair winds for now. Oh, 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 o